Welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Brashazade. And I'm Ashley Ward. And you're listening to the What Matters Podcast and our mission to spotlight top RIAs, wealth managers, and investment professionals who are redefining wealth management. Join us as we dive into their journey, strategies, and insights. Whether you're an investor or an inspiring pro, this is for you. Get ready for impactful conversations on the What Matters Podcast. Welcome back to the What Matters Podcast, where we dive deep into the world of wealth management, uncovering strategies, insights, and stories from industry leaders. I'm Mike Mershazday. And I'm Ashley Ward. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Kelly Campbell, Chairman and CEO of Campbell Wealth Management, a renowned retirement planning firm based in Washington metro area, based in Alexandria, Virginia. With over 25 years of experience in the field, Kelly has become a leading expert of retirement planning. Kelly's been quoted and contributed to numerous business publications, including Fox Business, TheStreet.com, CNBC, The Washington Post, to name a few, and a recurring blogger for the Smarter Investor on U.S. News and World Report, and also the author of his own book, Fire Your Broker. Welcome, Kelly. Hey, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks so much. Well, we're so excited to have you with us today. Let's start by diving into your origin story. Could you delve into the personal journey and tell us about your background from graduating from finance degree at the University of Maryland and then the experiences that led you to establishing Campbell Wealth? Yeah, so uh, so I guess I'll, I'll even start in college. Start there is probably the best bet because I, I was originally an engineer. And okay. uh, when, I, when I wasn't doing very well in engineering, uh, it was interesting. I, I was uh, meeting with someone who was selling me a waterbed for my office or for my, uh, for my door. <laughs> That was like water beds in the dorm. So anyway, I'm meeting with this guy and we just got to talking and I said, hey, what, what's your major? I'm having all kinds of trouble with what I'm doing. He, I, I said, I want to make a lot of money, but I, I really don't know what I want to get into. And engineering is just not working. So uh, he said, he said, wow, dude, you should be in finance. I said finance, well, you're there. You know, how can you not make money when you're working with people's money? <laughs> so literally, I changed my major right then and there. And uh, within uh Probably the next semester, I was fully loaded with finance classes, started doing really well in college. My grades were going up considerably uh, and just really started to enjoy it. So, uh, so that's kind of the beginning. Uh, I started out on the insurance side, as a lot of people do uh, years ago. I don't think as much anymore, but literally working for um, uh, two little, actually one little company, one big company, uh, home life insurance for a very short period of time and then equitable. And uh, Equitable, what I really liked about my experience at Equitable, it kind of taught me the insurance side of the business and, you know, kind of understanding protection and why people needed it. So it was kind of interestingly enough, it was the basis for everything I was, you know, started with. Um, when uh, when I finished that, I kind of went through in um, the, the, I guess, the GA, the general agent that I was working with had decided, he said, hey, I'm going to take our whole group. We're going to move over to a different company called Minnesota Life. And, uh, and that was a great experience. We spent a short period of time there, but as a group, we moved over. Um, we went for about four years. And, uh, and I really learned a lot about, about lists because uh, Minnesota Life had a number of companies that they had. One of them was a company called Minister's Life. And, and that in and of itself is a whole interesting story. But, but they had all these old Minister Life uh, contracts, but they just bought them. They had nobody to service it. So I said, hey, can I have a list of those leads? And we started making calls on those leads, uh, just learning a lot about different different vocations as well. Even ministers not having to pay into Social Security, you know, just kind of learning that kind of stuff as well. And then working with other ministers, realizing that I could also work with their congregations. So that worked out pretty well. It was kind of interesting. Um, and then at some point, I guess, uh, AXA or Equitable, which was also uh, bought out by AXA Advisors, the French company, had uh, wooed our general manager, our general agent back. So we as a company left after four years of uh, Minnesota life, moved back to Equitable. Um, And at that time, it was kind of interesting because that's when uh, Equitable really got good at what they were doing. And they they got a lot better at not just trying to provide protection products, but really focus on financial planning. And they gave me a background in financial planning because at some point they required people to do fee-based planning. So they made everybody get their Series 65. They made us start charging fees. They said, if you are going to work with a client, you have to charge them a fee. And you can charge them like a, you can do a base plan or you can do a full plan. And I thought that was a great experience. They ta- they sent us out to uh, Alpharetta, Georgia. They taught us how to do it. Um, you know, and and, uh, and we really got good at it. So I was, uh, I guess I was one of, the, one of the top financial planners in the office, you know, understanding how to use the software because I'd already been using some financial planning software in the past. 
And, and that's what gave me kind of the real financial planning background. So now I had the insurance and the financial planning. And then I um, then I decided, you know, I'm, I'm just I don't feel as independent because they were they were kind of restricting me on some of the product and strategies I could use. Um, and they only wanted me to use the ones they kind of had under their roof, if you will. Um, and so I started to branch out a little bit and then finally went with uh, Signature Investors, which is part of John Hancock. And the reason I went with that company was that they were really focused on investing. And, and so that next stage of my journey was really learning kind of the investment world and, you know, how investments work. And I, even uh, they had an RIA, Registered Investment Advisory, which allowed me to kind of understand the whole thought about charging a fee for investment management. And, and they manage all the investments. But, you know, I ended up bringing a, you know, a bunch of clients in um, and I did that for about three years. And that was all through because uh, I remember being in that building during 9-11. So perfectly remember that kind of where you were during 9-11. So I remember that very, very quickly. I'm sorry, through, through 2001. So um, I remember that. And then from there is when I decided, all right, I was restricted by my first company, even restricted by Hancock Signature uh, on what I could, what products and strategies I could work with. I think I want to go out on my own. And that's when, that was a big point. That was 2003. Uh, September 2003, I decided to to go with, and that was LPL Financial. So you, you're kind of getting earful with all these different companies, I know. Um, but that journey, what, what I really liked about it was I, I got to know the basics of the foundation of protection, the financial planning side, the investment side. So when I started on my own, I kind of had a whole package together and, and it really worked out well. So going out on my own, um, in my own building, having to write, you know, get my own lease, you know, working with LPL Financial, being able to be completely independent, use whatever product and strategies I wanted, really helped me excel. And, and I think that was probably the, the biggest change of my career because it really uh, allowed me to see what other advisors were doing, not just advisors with a captive agency, but more advisors that were, you know, kind of on their own and doing well and, and you know, blowing the cover off the ball. So that's probably where probably my best advantage came from. Did that for 15 years uh, and did it under the name of Campbell Wealth Management. Um, left Signature in 2018 to uh, have a, I'm sorry, left, left LPL Financial in 2018 just to have a little more independence because LPL was kind of, they had gone public and things were kind of changing with their marketing strategies and things like that and their compliance. So I said, there's got to be a better way. They're kind of, now, I feel handcuffed again. Every time I feel handcuffed, I need to need to kind of, you know, I need a little more freedom, be able to, to get to the people I want to get to. Um, and that's when I, I really, I changed broker dealers, which wasn't that big of a deal because most of what we did was under our registered investment advisory. Um, but we were probably, my guess is we were at around, I'd have to say 500 million of assets under management at that point. Um, and then uh, I went with, uh, like I said, the, the new broker deal was Madison Avenue Securities. And uh, I've, I've, just so you know, I've always been a big marketing person, always been a growth strategy guy and love, love, love to grow the company and figure out ways to, you know, just help people through financial planning, education events, um, you know, those types of things. So I, I, I know that was a long winded answer, but hopefully you got the, the point. Oh, we appreciate it. Oh, I, yeah. Thank you. So, building on that, Kelly, what specific experiences or insights motivated you to narrow your firm's clientele? Uh, to those age 55 plus, how did this uh, special, specialization evolve over time? Yeah, yeah again, I, I've been a marketing fiend for years. I read all these marketing books. I was reading marketing books when I was in my teens. So, you know, classified ads and all these different things. So some people will know exactly what I'm talking about. Most everybody's there, like, what's he talking about? What's, what's he mean? Um, but it was interesting. I um, I'd read all these different things and I always heard the, the line, there's riches and niches. Right. And the more broad you are, the less uh, the harder it is to, to really uh, spec, I guess, specify in an area and become really good at it. So I said, you know what? I said, we're really good with uh, with retirement. We know it pretty well. The retirees have more money or the people close to retirement have more money than, let's say, you know, people my age or the you know, 30s and 40 and 50 year olds. So we really started going with the 55 plus age and. Um, and we already had the financial planning down and the investment management down. So we kind of put it all together. I started doing uh, a lot of seminars. So seminars to teach people about retirement. Um, I uh, had, I, when I started with LPL, I also got into Ron Carson's coaching program. Uh, oh, cool. which was called Peak Performance. Oh, yeah. back then. 
my my uh, t- uh, twin brother Darius, who's also my business partner, uh, just interviewed Ron Carson on his podcast. Oh, he's awesome! Yeah, yeah, love love Ron. We're, and he, we know each other very very well. Uh, he's been he's just been great, you know. And he, the the I think the key to that was not only was he a great coach, but he was you know he he always talks about this his book Testing in the Trenches because he was he was in the trenches. I mean he he wrote a book on things not that were 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 popular in industry things that he was doing. And I, and I think that's what really kind of caught my eye as well. And, and again, I had been through all kinds of different coaches from strategic coach to, to um, and with Dan Sullivan and, you know, Ron Carson as well, Tony Robbins, you know, just so many different coaches that, that have kind of helped me along the way. But I really like Carson's program because it just it helped the advisor think bigger. And I've been on, on his, his stage a number of times speaking to the advisors as part of the group. Uh, and what I realized was that you need to have a strategy, right? You need to have something that differentiates yourself. But I also realize you can have the best of both of those. You can have the cure for cancer, but if nobody knows about you, where are you going to go with it, right? So that's when I, I just really realized throughout that time that I really want to be able to to get in front of more people, and that's really why probably the biggest reason I did seminars, so I could get in front of more people. You know, instead of the the you know the the one on one advertising, the one to many, and and it really significantly helped. Well, well, let's highlight on that. Um, you've obviously been able to build your firm. Uh, I, I don't believe any AUM when we read it because Ashley and I obviously get misled there um, to to uh, close to or over a billion dollars now. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong there, please. Uh, yeah. it, it's uh, we are at just over a billion of AUM, and then with assets under advisement, you know, things like uh, outside strategies, investment strategies, we're at just under one point two. That's phenomenal. Um, and uh, tell me about that. Did you grow the company through doing those seminars? Uh, how were you able to grow your company? Did you do it mostly organically, inorganically? Uh, with, without a doubt, the seminars. Um, you know, it, I, I think a couple of different things. One is uh, when I was in strategic coach, um, I uh, can't remember my coach's name, but she has a really good point. And that was, it was all part of Dan Sullivan's program. But one of the things she talked about was this 10 times mind expander. And it was one of the things that really set me in motion for, for growth. And all it is, you take wherever you are right now. Let's say you're doing whatever it is, $100,000 a year in revenue, a million dollars a year in revenue, $10 million, and you just 10x it. You know, so 10 times minus spender, 10 times the amount. And just say, okay, if I'm, I'm doing a million, right? Now I'm doing 10 million, right? Now I, now I write down everything I would have to do to be at 10, not, not to get to 10 million, but to be at 10 million. How would I look different? Who would my clients be? What kind of marketing strategies? What kind of team? What kind of office? What kind of um, you know financial planning and investment process would I have? And every time I've done that, it's significantly grown my practice. And so I do it fairly often, but it really, it just helps you to kind of think bigger. So instead of, you know, the, the average firm grows by, I don't know, 10 or 15%, I'd imagine, um, we were growing by 50% and 80% and 100% because we were thinking so big that even if we completely messed up, and only grew by, you know, the 25% of the, what that 10x was. That's still, I said two and a half X. Right. So really valuable to have that conversation. I, I like what you said there. Uh, you know, I, I, I um, and Ashley can attest to this. I often do those, do, do those boards um, and, and write down, I mean, I write down the goals, you know, you know, every day Ashley and I were on the Franklin Covey system, you know, dating all the way, dating all the way back to what the, <laughs> I started in the early nineties using it. But um, yeah, I think that's very important. And, you know, uh, I would say like on my whiteboard, um, I'll wipe it clean uh, about once every two or three months and rewrite everything just to remind myself of the stuff that I've been procrastinating on. Um, so, you know, when you say that, you know, you guys have grown by that much, uh, it doesn't surprise me because when you're constantly reminding yourself, you know, there's there's a point in a learning in a, in a, in a learning to that. Um, tell me more about your firm there. How many advisors do you guys have now? And uh, Mike, Mike, can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Uh, one more thing I'd add is I also had a vision board. I always I was really a big proponent of vision boards. And I think I got that from John Asaraf. Can you tell uh, us one thing that you put on your vision board? Oh, all kinds of different things. I, I um, so <laughs> I've had I've had a number of vision boards. I, I wish, I wish, I wish I had my old one. I just don't have it anymore. I, I don't know how it got thrown away. Maybe it's somewhere in, in stores. But um, but one of the things I said, you know, when I was a kid, I, I used to live across the street from the from the Chesapeake Bay, and you know, we had a boat, but you had to put it on the trailer and you had to put it in the water. And I said, so one of the things I said, I said, when I grow up, 
I'm going to have a house on the water and I'm going to have a boat and a dock where we can literally water ski right from there. And so I put that on my vision board, right? I said, I'm going to have a wine cellar in my basement because I started liking wine. And I said, you know, I think it was like, you know, I had really nice watches, you know, so I, so I was, you know, was focused on, on having nice watches and things. And so, but it's amazing though, everything on that list, everything I hit. So what I did was I built another list, you know, and, and it wasn't, you know, the vision board is all about pictures, right? So you literally just go to a magazine, you, you know, if I say, hey, I want, to have, I want to have a house on the water with a pier, I need that house on the water with a pier. I need a picture of that so I can see it. And, and you know, it's just amazing when it gets in your head, these things just start to happen. You're, you're, you know, you just unconsciously start to do things that make them come true. So, uh, so I would definitely advise for everybody to the 10 times mind expander and then do that vision board. Both of those exercises, they just, they help you grow considerably and quickly too. I, I, I love that. Your vision board was, was so much more sophisticated than mine was, right? <laughs> You know, I, I, I grew up uh, down the street. I don't know if you remember a show called 21 Jump Street. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's, there's uh, one of the undercover cops was this Asian guy. Um, and he lived uh, right down the street from my brother and I. We grew up in the L.A. area. And he had an Acura NSX. And I think my first vi vision board had, you know, that Acura NSX on there. Although I never owned the Acura NSX, right? I think I was just too big for it. Um, you know, <laughs> I always had that car in mind. Um, but you know, you had a, a house on the water with, with, with a wine cellar. Um, I love that. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. So now I'm sorry, now I'll go back to your question about the team. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and I do think, I think one of the most important things you need to be thinking about as a, first of all, as a business owner, any business, uh, and then second of all, as trying to expand considerably is you can't do it all right. And, and that's it's really hard to give up control sometimes of things, but you have to because you'll never you'll never grow unless you give up control. And then, unfortunately, what that means is you have to trust people are going to do what you want them to do. And worse yet, especially for me, it means you've got to be really clear with them on what you want them to do. And you got to know what you want them to do. And I never was it's, well, I can't say never, but in the very beginning, especially, I was really bad at kind of, you know, hiring people and, and figuring out how to tell them what to do. I just figured. Well, you know, they should know it. I, if I tell them once, they should know everything. And I was so wrong, you know, and, and the more I shared and the more I repeated what needed to be done, the better it got done. Right. And the more I wrote it down, the more I had systems and processes in place. And, and even, um, you know, working with Carson at, in the coaching program, they had, they were all about systems and processes and uh, what a great thing to, to have as kind of the, the basis for, for really building the business. And so what I started to do, and I, then, by the way, I read a good book, too, that kind of, and it kind of encapsulated all this information. It was called, the first one was called The E-Myth. And it's called, the, actually, The E-Myth Revisited. So The E-Myth was all about how to start a company knowing that, you know, like, let's say it, it starts out with a, a woman that bakes pies really well. And so what, what it talks about is the fact that, you know, yes, yeah, she bakes pies, but is she really just ready to start a business? So, uh, you know, she had this kind of coaching person that helped her along and said, okay, you're good at baking pies, but you know, there's more to the business than just baking pies, right? Someone needs to, to work the counter. Someone needs to hire people. Someone needs to sweep the floor. Someone needs to clean the bathroom. Someone needs to clean the ovens, you know, all these different things. And then what the book got her to do, what the person in the book got her to do was just to kind of put all these things on paper and say, these are all the jobs that need to be done. And then realize that I have to do all of them, Right. But that's OK, because now I know at least they're written down and at least I know what every position holds. And then I, I, in, I in me following that process, I then hired my first assistant, which meant those things under the assistant that I was you know, formally doing. I now gave off to that new person. Right. Then I said, OK, I need someone to make phone calls for me for, uh, you know, the assistant's going to run the office, do paperwork and things like that. But I need someone to go with me to seminars to make the, you know, and make the phone calls, you know, kind of get everybody's, uh, you know, evaluation forms and make the phone calls to set the meetings, make sure the meetings happen, do the follow-ups to make sure the second meeting happens. So, you know, but, but it was really, it was very well, well spelled out, you know, and next thing, you know, I, I needed, you know, someone that was going to, I, you know, I never really was the portfolio management guy. I mean, I've done it in the past without a doubt, but I, but I knew someone could do it better than me. So I hired a portfolio management person. Right. And so so now how we're built, we're built in all these different teams. So it's 32 of us, I believe now um, we've got a um, 
we've got a, an operations department that really does all the, the back office things, including finance and, you know, and, you know, just basic ops, you know, getting the office running correctly. Uh, we've got a marketing team that does all the marketing, you know, communications to our, our events, for our, our client events, for our client communications. Um, we have a wealth advisory team, wealth advisor of business development people. So once the marketing folks bring in the lead, let's say, and I, I typically do a lot of the public speaking, but once their lead gets in, it goes to our wealth advisory team, right? And they're all certified financial planners. And then they'll take them through a process, a very well-documented process that they'll go through. And once they finish that process and they, they, they get that client to say, yes, I'd like to become a client of Campbell Wealth Management. Now we bring them, you know, we bring them on board, do all the paperwork. We got a, a transition department that does all the transitions. Uh, then once that's done, we actually get that client situated, their financial plan, their investments are situated, you know, actually reallocated. And then there's a handoff to a wealth manager, right? And the wealth manager is also a, a, a group of CFPs, but a different group. Now, let me explain that. This, this is probably one of the keys to my business and our success is I knew I, I, I had taken a number of different, uh, you know, Myers-Briggs and Colby and DISC tests, personality profile tests in the past. And what I realized was that there are people that are really good at some things and really bad at other things, right? right? And so salespeople are typically not good at nurturing, right? So right. if you think of the old, the old insurance line, finder, binder, grinder, minder, right? Yeah. You know, the people that are good at finding and binding, right, typically your salespeople are not really good at grinding, putting all the, the, the information together, right, and then minding, taking care of the client once they're a client. So I set up two different groups, our wealth, our wealth advisory or call them business development CFPs, and then our wealth management, call them client service CFPs, right? So now all of our clients have a dedicated uh, client service person or really their own dedicated CFP fiduciary. Right? And that was really important because what I realized was that we can keep our, our uh, retention ratio very, very high. We're typically at 98 to 99% every year. Um, and we keep it high because I know my clients are getting taken care of and then build systems and processes around all that as well. And then um, we also have our, our investment management department that's really there to, to do all the investment management. Right? I, I didn't want to have my team because I've heard so many teams that, you know, Hey, I, I don't have time to work on the portfolio because I've got a client meeting. How do you want to have that? I mean, these are, you know, we're managing $1.2 billion. I can't not have our portfolio monitored 24 seven. And so we've got a, a wealth or an investment management team that that's all they do. And Mark Wagner, our CFA has been with us for 10 years, done a phenomenal job. And, and, you know, so, so when you kind of bring it all together and obviously compliance is in there and accounting and that's all part of ops, but all of our teams cover everything that needs to be done. And the more we can get all those teams to work together and, you know, and, and thrive together, the better off the company runs and, and the better off the client experience as well. So does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Incredibly valuable. Uh, that kind of segues perfectly into what I want to ask you next. I wanted to talk a little bit about your trademark program, the right on retirement. Um, that can you walk us through that seems to be a five step process that you and your team use. Can you walk yeah. through that process and how it's contributed to the success of your client's retirement planning journey? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so right off the bat, uh, I'll, I'll kind of where I where I didn't go, but it's part of my origination story is why I believe financial planning is so important. So, when I was in high school, it was me, my brother, my sister. I was going into it was this. Um, I guess it was the summer before my junior year of high school. I was getting ready to go into my junior year. My brother and sister, even though they weren't twins, they were going in the same year, going into freshman year of college. My father was in the military, so my sister got held back. So, But they were both going into freshman year of college for their first year. Anyway, my father had a heart attack that summer, and he actually passed away. Well, my father was a breadwinner of the house, and so he's the one that made all the money. My mother had stayed home with us as kids, so she was a part-time travel agent at that point. And so when he passed away, his income went away, too. And so, you know, I just remember, you know, my mother being really upset. I remember hearing her one night, not knowing if she could even keep the house, you know, so it, it, it was a, it was a really tough situation for everybody. So anyway, what ended up happening, we all got jobs. We pitched in, you know, to keep the house going for our schools. I was going to a little uh, private Catholic school, which uh, wasn't outrageously expensive, but it was still a cost. My brother and sister going to Towson State in Baltimore uh, for her first year in college. So all these things had expenses. Plus we, you know, my mother had a mortgage, you know, she had to, you know, put, 
you know, food and on the table and all the different things associated with that, which she was never responsible for before. And what I, what I realized was that, and again, I, I didn't, I was, you know, what, seven, 16, 17. So I didn't realize it right then, but what I really understood, or I started to understand was the fact that they needed a financial plan. If they had a financial advisor, they probably would have been in a much better situation, right? They would have thought about, Hey, you know what? You're the breadwinner. You're not, if you die, you're in trouble, right? They're talking between my mom and dad, you know, but if, if my mom died, my father would have been in trouble as well. He had, he would have had the money, but no, no, but you know, no care for the kids, you know? So, so there's a lot of nuances that I think that financial, financial plan brings out. And so that's why I believe everybody needs a financial plan. So every one of our clients has a written plan. That plan is reviewed by a CFP first when they first become a client and then every single year after that, no matter what, that's one of our requirements. So that's part of the writing retirement process. So initially, when someone first comes in, depending on how they come in, what type of uh, program, either an educational webinar or one of our, um, our dinner seminars, wherever they come in, we are going to then bring them in for a discovery meeting or sometimes we call it a lab class as part of our educational program. So when, we, when they come in, we really want to find out what's going on. You know, what, what, how can I help? Even if it's just verbally today to give you some more information, even, even if you're not a good fit for us, I want to help you in some way, shape, or form, right? And that's our, really our wealth advisory department. Um, from there, we'll go into a planning session, right? Or, and not everybody goes to a planning session. Not everybody wants to. Not everybody hits our minimums. Not everybody, you know, not everybody's a good fit for us. So if you make it through and we invite you in to come to a planning meeting, what that means is you've, you've kind of, you've gone over that next bar, you have a need that we think we can fulfill, and we think you, you, you will see value in what we provide, right? So that'll be the planning meeting, which will be next. From there, we'll go into a confirmation meeting, if it makes sense. It means, you know, it, like we both agree at that second meeting, hey, Campbell provided something really good. Uh, the client looked at it and said, hey, I think that's valuable. We kind of have a meeting of the minds. And so the confirmation meeting is about bringing them on board, right? And then we'll have an allocation meeting as to, uh, and by the way, in the planning process and throughout, we're talking about uh, asset allocation. We're talking about uh, their current investment portfolio and, you know, kind of issues with it. We're talking about tax planning, Roth conversions, all these kind of things. Um, and then when we go into that allocation meeting, which is really the fourth part of it, it's, it's, it's okay, let's get you situated to what's going to make sense for your future going forward. Right. And we'll put them in, you know, whether it's going to be all AUM, whether it's going to be AUM with some kind of side strategy, whatever it's going to be. And then the last part is that handoff to that wealth manager. So they're dedicated, certified financial planner, fiduciary. That's going to be there to, to have all the meetings with them on a consistent basis, be there for phone calls, you know, to do that plan once a year and to just be there, you know, quarterly reach outs, all those kind of things that are going to make the client feel heard and feel confident in where they are and where they're going. So, so that's, that's what right in retirement's about. Yeah. Wow. And thank you for sharing that personal story. I mean, that's really, it probably fuels your fire each day when you go into work and really with what you do. Um, it does. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's evident that you've established a process that is significantly impacting your clients. Would you be able to share a specific client success story where you felt you made a significant impact in their lives? Yeah, you know, I, I just, um, I, I try not to prepare for these kind of calls because I think just the more I can come off the cuff, the better off it is because, you know, it'd be great questions. But, you know, one that comes to mind right off the bat, I think, is um, there was a woman we brought in. Obviously, I won't share any names, but, but you know, I, I share a lot of stories in the in the uh, presentations that I do, but, you know, obviously never the names, but they're all true stories. So true story, uh, a woman, her husband became clients. Uh, they were about, they probably had five years before retirement, maybe a little bit longer. And the husband developed Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's was one of those things that hit really quickly. So it was kind of, first of all, out of the, out of nowhere. And then second of all, very aggressive. So within like a year, the guy couldn't work anymore. And he worked for the government. He had planned on working another five years. And the five years would have given him several things. One is it would have given him more time on his pension. So his pension would have been higher. Number two, it would have given him more time to contribute to the 401k and get the matching Right. The, in this case, the government's TSP. Um, and it also the third thing would have would have allowed him more time before he started collecting the money. Right. You know, if you think about it, if someone retires at at their plan of retiring 65 and they're going to live to, I don't know, 85. Right. They got to fund 20 years. But if they retire at 
60. Now they get to take care of 25 years and they got less money, less time to put money away. So if they retire early, it just makes it more difficult. Anyway, living in this area and having a mortgage, all those things stacked against them. The husband wasn't making any more money. He took his pension earlier. The wife had to take her pension early. Um, you know, and it was just a, it was kind of like all these dominoes falling at once and falling down on them. When we did the plan originally, they were completely fine. When the situation happened where he couldn't work anymore, the plan failed. So the Monte Carlo analysis showed that they were going to run out of money. Um, I mean, not right away, but they they were going to run out of money. So when the plan doesn't work, we always say we got to do something to fix this. And so we started talking about it. And, then, and by the way, the wife was working, but she was just a, she, I almost going to say just a, but she was a part time real estate agent at that point, really just working part time because she didn't have to work full time. Right. But now she started working full time or as much as she could because she still had to care for her husband. So. Um, they were both coming to the meetings. At some point, he couldn't come anymore. So she was coming to the meetings. And, and at one point, I said, you know, your plan's just not going to make it. I said, Let's, we, we've got to think about a plan B here. And what we came up with was, we said, what if, what if you, I said, have you ever thought about moving out of the area, retiring somewhere else? And, um, and she said, yeah, well, you know, me and my husband years ago thought about moving to Texas because I got family there, but we, we decided not to do that. We're just going to stay in this area. I said, would you consider it now, though? She said, well, I don't really know. She said, I'm, I'm getting ready to go for on a trip to Texas, so I'm going to visit my sister. Maybe I can look at it while I'm down there. So obviously, she was a real estate agent, so she started looking at some house prices and things. It turns out she came back, and she said, we're moving to Texas. She found a house that she was going to be able to take. You know, she, So she, she had a house worth X, right? She had a mortgage on it. But when she sold it, she would have had, you know, let's say Y left over. Well, that why, that difference would pay off a house, pay for cash in Texas and still have money left over. So now they didn't have a mortgage. So when I put that into the plan, it worked perfectly. So those clients now live in Texas. They are still clients of ours. Everything's going well. Their plan's going perfectly well. Husband's still still alive um, and again, still has Alzheimer's. But it, it was a good story because the plan was failing. I mean, she wasn't going to make it. And there was, you know, a lot of people don't do financial planning. They wouldn't have realized that she was going to run out of money. So uh, so I, I kind of look at that. That's a big win, a big win for everybody, because now we put her in such a better situation. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Absolutely. So, and, and again, Kelly, thank you for sharing so much with us today. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, looking ahead, what's your envision for, for Campbell Wealth? Um, any new initiatives on the horizon there for you guys? You know, I, 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 a couple of different things. And, and um, you know, we talked a little bit about this, about AI. Uh, I think AI will have a place in our business. Um, I look at it more from a marketing standpoint. I think there's a lot of great value there because it can help us kind of, you know, see some other opportunities that we haven't seen in the past. It can help us kind of develop opportunities as well. So I think there will be some some value there. Um, I, you know, I just uh, I've, I've read uh, one book I absolutely or one author I absolutely love is is um, Alex Hermosi. And he wrote a couple of different books, $100 million leads and $100 million offers. And I've read a lot of marketing books, uh, but by far, he is my favorite marketing person, like beyond belief favorite. If, if you know, your audience wants to do that, go get them. Actually, just, just look them up. Just look at some YouTube videos. Uh, one of the smartest marketing person people I've ever seen, and he and his wife kind of, they tag team um, with his company, um, which is now called acquisition.com. But he sold a number of different companies. But it's really key that what I really like, he said this one thing that was really important. He said, he said, I want to give away the information and I want to sell the implementation. In meaning, you know, I got a lot of great stuff in my head. I, I, can, I can explain a lot of great things. And, and some people are really good clients for us. But a lot of people aren't, right? And some people could be a good client, but they don't want to be a client. That's fine too. But if I can provide value to everybody, Right by giving away the information, in those people that want to become clients, right that, that say, you know what, I want to go further with, with with this company. Those are the ones I'll sell the implementation. That's where I'll get paid. But uh, I think I think people are just you know sadly they don't nobody wants to share information anymore. And I think there's such uh, such a need for information. You know, I, I mean everybody can say yeah, well, I can just search that on Google. Yeah, and you'll get a million, million different answers. Which one's right? Which one's the best? Which one's the best for you? Which one coordinates with all the things you're doing? So just kind of looking at it to be able to say, hey, let me let me help you understand Social Security. 
we help you understand why it's so important to do planning for it and what that could mean. And, and let me help you understand what it's going to look like if it really does, in fact, go down by 20% in 2034 and 2035, right? Those are really important conversations. And you build a trust with an audience when you do that. You know, it, it's kind of a, there's also something called the law of reciprocation. That's not why I'm saying to do it, but but it really does. It It, it is a, a thing in, the, in play, which is you do something for someone, they feel like they want to do something for you. You know, but I just feel that if you can, if you can become confident enough in your business and in what you provide that you can give it away, you will have clients lined up at your door to work with you. Yeah. I like that. Now looking ahead, what emerging trends or developments, I mean, you mentioned AI, but any others that you foresee shaping the future of wealth management? You know, I, I, I think there's, I think there's all kinds of things going on. I'm not convinced that everybody needs all kinds of things. You know, I, I think that there's some, some things that, you know, when you have somebody with a highly appreciated stock position, you know, and they can only sell so much, I think there's some different, you know, uh, option strategies you can utilize to, to, you know, help make them in a little extra money or help reduce risk, depending on what you're looking to accomplish. Uh, I think there's some, some, you know, aggressive, uh, investment strategy you can utilize that I think can work really well, but you know, just realize it's going to be more for your longer term money because they can still lose pretty well also, uh, but over time they should outpace a lot of other things. Um, I think tax strategy is going to be huge. I, I, I teach a whole tax class, taxes in retirement, um, and I bring up the U.S. Debt Clock. So the the website is usdebtclock.org, and really I bring it up and just talk about the, where the debt is and what the interest rates are and how much the government's paying for interest right now. And, and how the government makes money, which is tax tax revenue, right? So I truly believe tax rates are going up, and and I don't think a lot of a lot of advisors talk tax. It's you know our biggest our three biggest expenses in retirement will be housing, healthcare, and taxes, and people don't want to talk about the tax side, but it's so important because I I think taxes are going to go through the roof. I don't think they have any other way to go, uh, and especially when the tax rules change in twenty twenty six. When uh, and then when all this, you know, kind of the, the stuff hits the fan and they really do start raising tax rates, people are going to realize, wow, I should have done those Roth conversions back then. You know, they're going to have conversations like that and say, you know, is it too late? You know, and, and, and it'll never be too late. You, there's always some things you can do tax strategy wise. But but I think that's going to be a really big conversation. It is right now with, with all of our clients on what we're doing tax strategy wise and then how it's going to improve their future as well. So those are probably the biggest trends I see right now. So uh, touching touching on that, uh, what do you think the econ or I, would, I should say, what's your opinion on the economic outlook? Um, you we brought the the debt that we're in. Um, we've seen what's happened to interest rates. Um, I mean the the cons you know the consumer spending. Um, you know, let's look at the ten year Treasury, right? You know, going from a half a percent all the way up to you know five percent at one point. You know, uh, you say tax. You say the taxes are going to be changing in twenty twenty six. What do you think the economic outlook is for the next several years? You know, it's a it's it's a great question. I'm surprised we we are where we are today. I'm surprised the market's where it is. Right, and I'm getting that same kind of thought process from a lot of folks in our industry. Uh, but you know what, it is, and we've got a process that works around it. So process that's very responsive to market changes. Um, but my take on it is, I do think the market is due, even though twenty twenty two was a down year. It wasn't a big down year. It was only down about 18% on the S&P. You would have thought it would have been down a lot more, but I think there's just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of scariness. I think there are a lot of folks that are, that are I, I think, not necessarily where I am. I'm in, in Northern Virginia, right outside of D.C. Not necessarily where I am, but I think across the country, there's a lot of people deciding whether to put food on the, on the plate or gas in the car, right? And it, they're ha making some really difficult situations, really calls on their situation. Um all that being the case, I think a lot of this could come crumbling down. I mean, I think it's going to take almost an act of God to keep her from doing that. You know, you got high interest rates, you got high inflation, you got people running out of money, you got people losing their jobs. You do have a lot of layoffs that nobody's talking about. Uh, it, it worries me. And so what I would advise, and we definitely have this, is having some kind of backup plan that says, hey, if the market tanks, here's exactly what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to keep you from losing a lot of money. You know, I think that's that's a really important conversation to have. The, the reason we work with people in retirement is not only is there a lot of great value for them and for us as a company, but it's really a difficult time. I mean, you know, people get to the point in at 55 plus where they say, I need to get my act together. Right. And so when they say that, a lot of times they're willing to say, 
I don't need all that risk. I want a, I want a uh, less volatile portfolio. I want more consistency in my returns. Sure. So I'll have more consistency in my income. So that's kind of the conversation. The it's it's remember retirement assets aren't just about building retirement assets. It's about building uh, typically a stream of income and you want consistency in that income. So however you can do that, that'll help the client not have to worry about it is really important. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I always have a backup plan. Before we wrap up, any final piece of advice you'd like to leave our listeners with? You know, I, I think um, I, I, was, I would say, look at that vision board thought process, no matter where you are. If you're, you know, if you're, you're not even in our industry, but you're about to retire. Uh, if you are in our industry and you're just starting or you're about to retire, anywhere in between. The vision board gets you to put on paper, but, but in a visual format where you want to be in the future. And what's really good about that is, you know, a lot of people can't can't like vision things. They can't like, you know, picture things in their mind. Uh, and then when they write a sentence, it's not nearly as good. So if you can put your goals out on paper and then you can put those by go just get in the magazine and cut out pictures, go online, cut out pictures. I mean, I've done this so many times and it's effective. It works 100 uh, percent. I mean, it, there's there are very few vision boards that have things on those boards that I haven't accomplished. And when they are, I take that off and put it on my next board. <laughs> So uh, that's what I'd say. I, I think, you know, anything's possible. My mother, my mother taught me uh, when I was a little kid, and I remember her saying this like a thousand times. And, uh, and I'll, I'll say it in her voice as well. My mother was pretty much right off the boat from Germany. She said, Kelly, listen, you can do anything you put your mind to. <laughs> so, you know, and she got me to believe anything was possible. And, you know, I, I often say that to her. She's, she's been great because she helped me think that way. And I truly, truly, truly believe it. But you got to have a vision for what you want or you'll never achieve it. So I agree. But that's exciting. We have a lot of exciting times. And I think people have a lot of great places to go, but they got to know where it is. Wise words. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us today, Kelly, and sharing your valuable insights. Really appreciate you being on the show. And it's been a lot of fun hearing what you have to say. Absolutely. Get to know you better. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you as well. Thank you. Yeah. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the What Matters podcast. Be sure to subscribe for more insightful discussions on wealth management financial planning. Until next time, take care.